Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, uh, Ralph and Monica and the organizers for inviting me to this event. Unfortunately, I could not um, come over to Clone today because we're in the middle of the semester, as, as you can imagine. But um, I'm very, very happy to be here uh, or to be with you uh, uh, um, from a distance to discuss topics that are very, very dear Hopefully, we'll be able to discuss during the, the um, discussion and question session uh, um, if there are you know, specific questions or topics that you want to cover. Um, OK, let me just move on to, my, um, to, to the main topics of my, of my lesson, assuming that, that you're all uh, seeing me and hearing me properly because I think we lost uh, the web. My webcam is on at the moment, so let's see if, if okay, okay, webcam back. Okay, <laughs> okay, fine. Okay, um, <laughs> okay. I, I really hope you bear with me during this talk and, and all the technology and everything. Okay, um, back to back to uh, our topic. Educating Translators with Corporate Exploratory Learning Revisited. In this talk, what I would like to do um, is to go back to um, a view of the ways in which corpora could be used for language learning, specifically. And I would like to uh, approach exploratory learning from the point of view of someone who's been involved with teaching uh, future translators, so educating translators, as I like to say, rather than training translators for, for quite, quite some time, both teaching them language and translation. The exploratory learning paradigm um, was presented, was developed, started in the early 1990s, and it was a reaction, really, uh, towards the approach to corpus use in language learning that assumed that what was relevant was the use of corpora to develop language material or, or language teaching materials or uh, dictionaries. And so the, the using corpora to define what to teach. And yeah, obviously, one of the most famous advocates of, of this position was John Sinclair. Um, but some, especially language teaching practitioners, um, proposed that, in fact, corpora also had other uses in the classroom, that they could be used for authentic, uh, hands-on use by the learners, self-directed uh, use by the learners, who would carry out their own searches, their own research, and use corpora to develop their competencies uh, in, a, in a more uh, autonomous way. Uh, and you may be familiar with some of these metaphors, every student Sherlock Holmes, or research is too serious to be left to researchers. And this was, uh, uh, this was uh, uh, um, um, statement, a claim, uh, originally made by Tim Jones, to whom we owe uh, very much. And my own, uh, my own um, proposal of looking at the learner as a traveler rather than a researcher, or uh, lear the learner as an explorer, if you like. Because the point here is not so much the, the end result, what the learner gets from the corpus, but the experience that she develops in during during the searches, during the corpus work. So in a sense, I thought the uh, traveler metaphor would be uh, more adequate. Um, of course, this is not just a um, um, simple metaphor for, for language learning. There are also, I think, interesting and sound theoretical bases. Well, first of all, formed focused instruction. Um, those of you who were already uh, in business in the, in the 80s and 90s know that, that uh, that was the heyday of communicative 
uh, of purely communicative language learning uh, and language teaching. Therefore, attention to form was not considered priority. It was not considered as something that learners needed. But there was also, but some some scholars also suggested that in fact, in order for learning to take place, uh, learners sh should also focus on language form, not just on on functions and actual practice of language, but also on language form. And this this uh, w was stated as the noticing hypothesis. It is important to notice the form of language in order to learn it, uh, or specific um, specific. Um, types of, of, of um, language structures. Um, more importantly, probably, um, data-driven learning or exploratory learning is also problem-based or task or project-based. So it involves solving problems to which there are no fixed solutions, something that learners hate. They hate not to know, or at least my learners, my students, hate not to have a problem with a fixed solution that they should get to. So uh, the idea that they have to to uh, carry out a, pro a research process, not knowing that where they're going to end, is something that they don't like. But in fact, I think it is it is also something that that it is extremely valuable for future translators because this is really part of, of to me what it means being a translator, a translator, knowing that there is no one solution and that you have to approach the best possible solution but you have to live with the uncertainty of it on it uh, and of course this is also a, a paradigm that fosters autonomy and and that teaches students how to learn for themselves in the future so uh, very coherent also with the, with the education of translators and it is also coherent with an idea of community of practice and situated learning which is also um, advocated by uh, obviously by translator educators and, and scholars uh, but in this sense uh, in the sense in which I'm using the the notion here uh, the classroom is itself a community of practice because the students in a classroom share a common situation in which they have to achieve a purpose. So I'm not using community practice in the sense of, of replicating the future um, uh, situation in which they will be working, uh, so a translator community of practice, but a learner community of practice. And we could see the classroom as, as a place in which something is being achieved and this something is the learning process. So that is also, um, that is also work experience, if you like. Um, so what is the role of, of, of exploratory learning with corpora in translator education? I will just briefly mention the main assumptions that I'll be relying on before moving on to some uses of, of exploratory learning in translator education. Well, first of all, what types of corpora are used in, uh, for, for translation purposes? I'm using translation-driven corpora that, that my colleague uh, Federico Valentin um, used in the title of, of a recent book of his. Um, there are two main uses of corpora in translator education uh, in my mind, namely a more applied purpose and or use and a more theoretical or descriptive purpose so in in uh, for translation driven, driven corpora can be used uh, for translator education from an applied perspective especially bilingual comparable corpora so collections of originals or non translated texts in two languages comparable in terms of genre and purpose to the translation that is being carried out, or parallel corpora, originals and translations into languages, the languages in which the translation assignment, translation task is being carried out. Uh, and of course, these can be used as sources, of terms, definitions, examples, uh, uh, etc. So sources of documentation material for a translation task. There is also a more um, applied and descriptive perspective in which monolingual comparables, so original uh, translations and originals in the same language, uh, and parallel corpora, again, originals and, and their translations, can be used as sources of insights about translator behavior. So you, you can use monolingual comparable and parallel corpora to investigate trans to investigate translator strategies, translator style, and also of course translation norms by looking at how translated texts differ from original non-translated texts in the same language that didn't undergo a process of, of, uh, of translation. 
uh, and you see translation norms and universals here because this is the area in which um, in which or this is the use of, of corpora uh, that has been uh, that has been um, the use of corpora that we witnessed in the, in the last 20 years monolingual comparable and parallel corpora for the investigation of translation norms strategies and universals um, and then briefly about the uh, the competencies, because really we need a, we need common ground on which to base our discussion of what our learners need uh, to learn during their studies. And for this, I thought I would use uh, a general framework of competencies, uh, namely the one that was developed by the EMT expert group that also owes a lot to the PACTE uh, framework. Uh, so it, it it is, I think quite broad and, and and we can probably agree that, that the competences that they mention are indeed extremely crucial to uh, the education of, of, of future translators. So I'll start with uh, the general framework, so six competences, six important central competences, but I'll split this uh, sort of wheel into two parts. Okay, some of these competencies, like themat thematic, technological, and info mining competencies, um, are competencies that have to do more with learning to do things. So practical abilities, um, namely, quickly, knowing how to search for information about specific fields, knowing how to use um, translation aids, and knowing how to, or developing strategies for uh, extracting information from various sources. And from the point of view of these three um, types of, of competencies, certainly corpora can help a lot. So obviously it is corpora, especially bilingual comparable corpora, can be um, used or, or can be constructed and used to acquire ways of, of uh, acquiring the thematic competencies quickly and efficiently. So translators are not doctors, they're not engineers. They need ways of, of, of learning enough of a given field to become semi-experts. Um, also, of course, corpora can be used to, uh, to learn to use corpora, so to learn to use documentation software, and to develop strategies for extracting for, from corpora terms and phrases. So this is this is what I would call a training oriented perspective, which is fully accurate, I think, to acquire these three competencies. You use corpora to learn to use corpora in the classroom. You teach learners how to use corpora so that they become familiar with the tool and they're able to use it appropriately, strategically, etc. Um, so going back to uh, Widdowson 1983, this would be a case where the output behavior of the learner should match the input instruction. You show them how to search for information in corpora, and they should be able to reproduce the same sort of behavior. Okay. Um, a typical teaching scenario, and I'll, I'll give you uh, an example from a course that I've been involved on, involved in for for quite some time. This is this is our MA in specialized translation at the University of Bologna. Uh, in, the, in the MA, we have two main areas in which corpora are used uh, for training purposes, for the purposes that I've just shown you. One is the translation methods and technology uh, course, and the other is the um, uh, specialized translation uh, course. So you just have, a, to, to give you an idea of the sort of, of workload that, that the students have to carry out for these exams, you have 15 credits. Uh, ECTS credits for uh, translation methods and technology, and uh, 40 credits in two years for the, the technical and specialized translation uh, courses, plus uh, translation for the publishing industry and multimedia translation. And corpora used, is pay, or these, these courses are uh, all taught at the computer lab with hands on experience, and, and students can um, actually learn to use the tools, and, and they, the courses have a professional orientation. Um, there's one course, in, of course, in which corpora are introduced, namely the information mining and terminology module of the translation method and technology. But then they're also used in all the other the other modules that is that you see in black, in uh, not not grayed out. Um, so I'll walk you very briefly through the info mining and terminology uh, type of experience that the learners get. A typical task project would be. 
to build a comparable, a bilingual comparable corpus, so originals in two languages for a, for a specific terminology assignment. Of course, the learners first have didactic input in traditional fashion, so presenting the tools and the strategies, practicing and then producing as a, in a, on a regular basis in the classroom. And then uh, they carry out their own projects where they have to build a so-called quality corpus, so they have to design it according to both selection and description criteria, and we explain to them the difference between selection and description criteria. With selection criteria, they must be able to uh, then construct, construct subcorpora based on selection criteria, whereas description criteria simply describe the corpus, but you can't assume that the components of the corpus ha have equal weights within the corpora themselves. So we teach them to evaluate the, the information density, the reliability and authoritativeness of the text to, to include in the corpus. And then we tell them something that they, again, don't like, that they have to document whatever they do. So they have to, to provide a readme file where they, um, they make a record of the decisions they make in building the corpora. They have to uh, construct the corpus so that, that it includes metadata and that subcorpora can be formed so that other people can then share their uh, their work and their their what, what they produce as as a result of of um, this corpus building activity. Um, so um, again, this so this this would be the the first part, and then as a second as a second part of this assignment, they also have to build a semi-automatic, larger but less uh, of lower quality corpus, and for this they use. Um, a tool that we developed here in Foley called Bootcut, uh, which is a, um, um, a tool that we use for uh, constructing corpora from the web uh, based on the seed words. So we provide of content word, or the learners, the student, corpus users, corpus builders, provide a list of seed words that describe a certain, a, a certain genre or a certain topic. They combine the or the tool combines them into random tuples. Uh, it sends them to a search engine and then gets the um, returns the web pages and formats them as text, uh, getting rid of all the HTML, etc., and creating a corpus in a single file. So if you're interested to know more about Bootcut, here you have a link. You can download it and see how it works. There's a tutorial. Um, so this is just an aside in case you're interested uh, in constructing corpora quickly. Not very, not not high quality corpora. There's always a trade-off between quality and quantity. But uh, you know, large corpora on specific topics using uh, using this tool. Um, okay, typical tasks continued. Once the corpus has been built, we use AntConc, so a simple a simple uh, tool for. Uh, building for for searching corpora uh, we use it to extract or we teach or learners know already how to extract term and phrases they have to provide lists of keywords engrams and clusters uh, from the corpus describing a certain uh, a certain uh, topic for their terminology assignment they extract exam examples and definitions using the concordance tool and then of course in the process they also have to master these ancillary skills, the skills that they need to carry out the previous tasks properly, namely, namely understanding regular expression searches, um, sorting results, uh, noticing patterns in quick screenfuls, something that is not very easy for some learners, and also identify good examples. So discarding noise and recognizing um, good examples of good definitions for a certain problem and also of course understanding understanding search techniques again something that doesn't come easily to learners that they have for instance because they they tend to use a corpus like they would use a dictionary so they want to find a word they type that word which is the wrong way of using a corpus because there's never a way of finding negative evidence if you do that okay, so you maybe you don't find a match but there's no way of knowing whether something else uh, is said in place of that word in the corpus. So they have to learn that in order to, type, to find the collocate, they have to type the node and so on. So obviously, this, this is trivial knowledge for someone who's uh, been using corpora for a while, but not necessarily for learners. 
So they have to practice that skill in order to, to master it. Um, but, but I want to move further, because okay? so this would be pretty basic, and I think um, maybe not what I want to focus on in this talk. I want to focus more on, uh, on another topic, which is how to use corpora to, for the other competencies in the, in the EMT framework. So very quickly, uh, the other competencies are linguistic competence. Uh, I, I'll let you read from the slide. I will not go through them, because I I don't think I have time. Uh, how much time do I have? Can anyone maybe tell me when I have five minutes left? Okay, good, good, thanks. Okay, so I'll, I'll okay, I have 15 minutes. Okay, that's good, that's good. So, um, the other three competencies that I want to, to focus on, uh, Linguistic competence, intercultural competence, and by intercultural competence, uh, the EMT experts uh, refer to both sociolinguistic and textual competences. And then, obviously, the most central, uh, not just because it's at the center of the wheel, but because it, it's a crucial competence for translators, namely translation service provision, which includes both being able to act as a translator. So interpersonal skills that are needed to be recognized as a professional translator translator, and also crucially the so-called production uh, competence so knowing how to translate appropriately which is really all about about being a translator knowing how to translate in a, in a sense also uh, you could see this as circular but some somewhere you have to state the translator is someone who can translate and, and they use the translation, the, the production part of the translation service provision to mention this. So being able to translate, revise, justify, and, and crucially also justify one's choices with appropriate meta language. So also uh, possessing um, awareness of the meta language that, that uh, translator scholars have. So my next question to you and to myself is can we also use? Corpus building and use corp activities of cor corpus building and use to develop these capacities and competencies, not just the more training oriented ones, but also these more complex types of competencies. Namely, can we use uh, corpus building and use, uh, or can, can we uh, resort to corpus building and use to teach our students? language competence of the sort needed by translators, which is arguably different from language competence that users of the language need. We're, we are educating language experts. They have to have a different type of, 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 uh, of competence in language use, including meta-language competence, of course. Uh, how can we use corpora to develop sociolinguistic and textual competences of the type that we saw before that are founded on intercultural awareness and also can we use corpora to acquire or teach translation service provision competencies? Uh, namely, make sure that our learners in the future will behave like translators, will be recognized as translators. Okay, these, are, these are the crucial questions that I'm going to try and, and, and or that I tried to answer in a course that I have been teaching this year. Um, this, this would be an education-oriented perspective because it, in, it involves learning how to learn with corpora. So using corpora as, as instruments to go beyond their own use, not just to learning to use corpora, but to develop other competences beyond those. So I will present you with a different, more challenging didactic set, setting, namely language and linguistic courses in the same uh, MA in uh, specialized translation at the University of Bologna, uh, that I showed you before with the courses in, uh, in technology and translation. We also um, hold language and linguistic courses. These are uh, courses, oh yes, by the way, this, this is a question for you, maybe um, to think about for the, for the question and, and discussion session. Uh, you may have noticed that there's a revival of interest in translation-oriented approaches to language pedagogy. We saw two interesting publications coming out in the past few years um, by Sarah Laviosa and Anthony Pym and colleagues on the fact that translation is also relevant, not just as a professional activity, but also um, 
as a learning and teaching activity for language learning. So my question uh, or topic for discussion would be, uh, will there be a renewed interest in also in language education for translators, not just in translator translation teaching for language learners um, in the future? Uh, I think it's an interesting point that we could discuss further. Um, the, 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 the course I'm, um, I've been teaching this year is a uh, 6 CTS two-semester course um, in English linguistics, in my case. And um, what is interesting, I think, and problematic for us is that it is traditionally disliked by students, not just my course, uh, but in general, our students of translation in the MA don't like courses, language courses, linguistics courses. And I think it's mainly a problem of an attitudinal issue, whereby they will be happy with any amount of translation practice, but not very happy with any course that obliges them to think about the language or, or about contrastive linguistics or descriptive linguistics of the foreign language they're studying. And this is something we've been struggling with for, for a long time. And I would also be interested to know um, your your experience in maybe in other universities and other in other countries. Uh, now, my question is: Can corpus use be beneficial in this sort of setting in a language and linguistics course for uh, um, for translation students who don't like language and linguistics courses? So this this is what I've been trying to uh, to do with them uh, using exploratory corpus work in the English linguistics uh, course that I've been teaching. Um, the course is two semester has is is, is um, one year long, so it, it takes two semesters. And in the first semester, what we did was uh, a, a very traditionally traditional um, um, approach, a, a very traditional course with lecture styles on systemic function or with lecture styles style uh, classes on systemic functional linguistics. Um, something that that the students were not familiar with. Uh, this is a first year course in the masters. Uh, so first part of the year, first semester, traditional uh, lectures on several topics or central topics in uh, systemic functional linguistics, uh, which will be evaluated in individual end of course oral exam. So again, very traditional. Some A part of this course is, is uh, standard and or at least traditional in the Italian, in the Italian academic system. The second part of the course, though, involves also uh, referring to um, how the input that they received in the first semester on systemic functional linguistics can be used uh, in translation studies, more specifically in corpus-based translation studies, in the search for universes, universals of language context situation. So the second semester is dedicated to exploratory work, a project that the students have to carry out based on the knowledge they've acquired about systemic functional linguistics in the first semester, and also about how systemic functional linguistics has been, has been applied in the past, was applied um, by translation scholars uh, in, uh, to, to investigate universals of language context situation, universals of translation. Um, so, the sec so this is what happens in the second semester, where the lessons become more workshop-like and project-based. Uh, uh, the students have to build their own corpus, and the corpus has to be monolingual, comparable, including either native English and no native English produced by L1 background writers, uh, L1 Italian background writers, or translated and non-translated English, where the translated English is translated from Italian. And I insist on the mono source. Um, mono L1 background or mono source translations, uh, because, or in, in the sense that I don't want them to uh, include in the corpus uh, text translated from several different languages because it is much more difficult to interpret results when they look at the translated or non native texts if they have no knowledge of the uh, source language background or source language of the translated text. So they build, they build their own corpus. Then they have to develop a hypothesis um, for and, and hoper, operationalize. So turn turn the hypothesis into something that can be searched for in the corpus. 
test their hypothesis comparing data across the two subcorpora and then we dedicate two three lessons to the presentation of their results where they have to give a 20 minute presentation with slides where they have to describe the genre that they cover in their uh, in their corpus give a literature review uh, and then discuss the methods results and and the discussion of, of the results and then present limits and further work um, then they use this uh, presentation as as a basis for writing an essay uh, and we spend the last two lessons uh, discussing giving them you know listening to their input and giving them feedback on academic writing uh, in linguistics and translation studies and then they submit the paper and that is also evaluated that's part of the final evaluation so a group assignment for the second part of the semester an individual oral exam for the first part of the semester I'll just give you an example project outline. The, the, the presentations are being done now. So I had one session yesterday uh, with the students and I have another one next week. So this is a very timely, uh, very timely uh, presentation with materials just submitted. Uh, an example project outline would be, for instance, a corpus of history sections in museum websites, which are typically translated from Italian into English uh, on Italian museum websites. Uh, so they, the, the stu my students, the so-called coffee breakers, they chose this, this name for their group, Francesca, Marino, Diletta, Ludovica and Silvia, they built a corpus of uh, translated and non-translated English um, hist history sections of museum websites, and this is the outline of, of their presentation and then of their essay that they will be, uh, they will be writing um, in the next few weeks. So they will present the, the text that they uh, they collected and give some references to previous literature about museum communication, um, describe their uh, process of corpus design and construction, uh, describe the genre and register uh, that they've selected, then give us some details about their uh, case study where they focused on passives in translated and non-translated English or use passive forms in translated and non-translated English where they expected um, higher frequency of passives in translated English versus non-translated uh, because the texts tend to be more detached uh, and less, um, less uh, they, they tend to be also more formal uh, being translated from, from Italian. So that this was their hypothesis. Uh, we'll see next week whether it was, it was confirmed or disconfirmed by the corpus. Um, and then discuss, they discussed their findings, including a discussion of normalization or shining whether the texts tend to be more similar, the translated texts tend to be more similar to the target language uh, English, or whether they carry traces of the source languages that they don't include in the corpus, that, but that they're aware of uh, and that they, they look at. Uh, and then the conclusion, recap of the study, results and implications, and of course, limits, and what they would do next if they were to proceed uh, along the same lines. Um, so summing up, because I think I have maybe about five minutes left, Ralph. Um, yes, five minutes. Okay, wonderful. So summing up, um, I think that corpus-based corpus research projects can be used in translation studies to develop meta-language competence which is one of the requirements of the EMT uh, network experts, uh, to become familiar with genre and register variation and analysis. So this would be inherently intercultural, um, an intercultural competence, because of course the students see the effect of the context of situation and context culture through their analysis of the register of the translated and non-translated texts, so they can compare uh, compare those and and reflect on cultural differences that that shine through the translated texts and of, of course they also observe and evaluate translator behavior and this is central to the socio constructivist approach because the students have to be aware of what current translator current professionals do how they make choices what strategies they use and through an analysis uh, of the, the, the translated and non-translated texts, they can acquire this awareness of what is currently being done in the profession. Of course, there are all sorts of pedagogic challenges involved. Uh, one 
has been observed already in data-driven learning in general, that there's a very steep learning curve. Some learners fail to grasp the basics of corpus exploration. They're not good at exploring corpus. So they need a lot of input from the teacher, from the facilitator. And as you all know from experience, sometimes there's no time for one-to-one -one, uh, teaching. That the stu Some students will know what they're doing already. They will... They don't want you to spend time on method because they they know everything already. Some of the students uh, lag behind, and it is difficult in within a, a, a single class to bring everyone to the same level of competency, technical and also a strategic competence uh, in corpus use. Um, novelty value: uh, more advanced learners may be looking for new ways of learning, so corpora can be uh, beneficial. But there's also a risk of concordance in burnout. They may think that it's simply too much work, and they want to have their answer. They want a dictionary to tell them uh, the, the the good answer. You know, they don't want to to keep searching the corpus. So there's also a risk of concordance in burnout. And there's also um, a problem that is related to the steep learning curve problem of learner variation. Because uh, in the literature, there are observations both coming from the literature on data-driven learning and the literature also uh, on translation projects. Uh, um, translation teaching based on, on, on projects that students, that the assumption that students can act as independent researchers and prepare for their own tasks sometimes is not warranted. Sometimes the students want to be guided or many times if you leave the student, students free uh, assuming that they will have find intrinsic motivation in their activities, sometimes this is not this is not warranted, and then uh, learning fails. There's also, however, I think, a great pedagogic potential involved. Uh, first of all, because this sort of, of activity, uh, teaching learning activity, can counteract the excessive preoccupation with technical expertise. Sometimes learners think that once they've mastered the uh, CAT tools and the corpus search engines, they're fine. They know what they need to know. Or the machine translation post-editing tools, that they don't need anything else. Whereas, if you oblige them to focus on deep learning from corpora, you show them that the technical expertise is just a prerequisite, but then they have to go beyond with, strategic, with more strategic uh, use of the resources. Um, secondly, there's, I think this sort of work or classroom activity reduces risk of excessive market orientation. I'm all in favor of preparing learners for the job. This is what we have to do and this is what we do all the time. But my fear is that we're going too much in that direction and that we forget that the learners don't only have to be ready the moment they enter the market. They also have to be prepared for a lifelong career. So they have to be prepared to learn what they need to learn in the future and remain good professionals for the whole duration of their careers. And I think this can only be achieved with slightly more complex activities that require them to think, um, to think more. <laughs> and of course, it can foster acquisition of research competencies. We may think that the research competence is not that important, but we want, if we want not for, for, for future uh, professionals who don't want to go on to, do, to carry out or to be in, a, in an academic profession. However, um, a profession, and I agree with Van Pieter 2013, that if we want the translational profession to uh, be recognized outside, that we also have to have a strong, a strong academic uh, competence developed. So we can't, we can't forget the academic competences that our students need, as well as the professional ones. And there's also a um, um, suggestion by Van de Pitte that an activity of, of that a research activity can also prepare students for translation. Um, she says she hypothesizes that students uh, describing and analyzing corpora can also reinforce their own their own uh, translation competencies. And for instance, if they study explicitation phenomena in corpora, they can become more aware of what they do when they themselves explicitate and, and mm -hmm. use explicitate, uh, explicitation in a more strategic, 
a competent way rather than a more automatic proceduralized way. And of course, uh, Van de Pitte says that it is up to empirical investigation to confirm or reject this. And of course, this is just a hypothesis, uh, a hypothesis that has also been put forward in data-driven learning that what remains to be to be defined is what is for what types of learners corporate is data driven learning good or bad what minimum resources are needed what language points are best amenable to uh, data driven learning approaches how can it be integrated with other learning and teaching techniques and this this preoccupation with finding uh, empirical data about the successfulness of the, the, the approach is also echoed by, within translation studies by, by a recent very interesting PhD thesis um, uh, whose author says that the question that needs to be answered is whether the use of corpora helps students develop a critical mind and whether it enhances their actual translation skills. And for the time being, I think we still miss uh, empirical evidence in this sense. And, and this is really what I think we should be focusing on for for the future. We know that corpora exist. We have them available. We we have to develop ways of bringing them to the classroom, but also then study whether they they can they can deliver, whether they can be useful as didactic didactic tools in the translation classroom. And I thank you very much.